Good morning. Good morning. As we uh, begin our worship this morning, we would just ask that we all quiet, quietly open our hearts to the light of Christ. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning, Grace Commons. We are so glad to worship you with you this morning, whether you're here or online. Um, how about last Sunday? Was so glad to see family and friends gathering to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Amen. Amen. And thanks for coming back. <laughs> for those of you who are. New to Grace Commons today, right after the worship, slightly after 11 o'clock, we're going to do a newcomer's coffee in Westminster Hall. It's a chance to connect with uh, staff over coffee and snacks. If you need to help, if you need help finding Westminster, if you're that new, you can go right through the doors and at the welcome desk, they can help you find Westminster. Um, and <clears throat> next, uh, if you're if you're interested in learning about how to become uh, more connected with Grace Commons, what we call covenant partners, uh, whether that's uh, learning more about our eco-denomination, uh, have questions about faith in Jesus, we're holding a three-week covenant partners class beginning next Sunday, April 23rd. And you can find out more about that uh, online or in the bulletin. And uh, for parents, who have kids of any age, uh, if you could use a little encouragement in a safe and confidential space, you're invited to come to a parent support group to share life, connect, process, and pray together this coming Tuesday at 6.30, also in Westminster Hall. Um, 
Also, you may, you may note that there's new art in the atrium and parlor space. The Christos Collective has switched out the art just this last week, so we invite you to check that out. So again, so many opportunities here at Grace Commons. Uh, please look online as well as in the bulletin for more. So now it's time to greet your neighbor. So one thing you might ask is, what made your Easter celebration special this year? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'd be, I'd, I think it'd be great just to talk for another 10 minutes, but if you'd uh, look back this way and we'll share our call to worship together, <laughs> or not. Nice. Okay, if you'd share with your the call to worship with me, please. God has abundantly cast his seeds of love and hope upon us. May we be fruitful, growing of hope and peace. Come, let us praise God, who is so generous with each of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Doesn't mean I should stand and we're singing together. The sunny in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the crown, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you got the sunny in the rock. Praying for a miracle, thirsty for the living word. Only you can satisfy. See, now I've tasted, it's not hard to see, only you can satisfy, cause there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. The spirit is bounty in the wilderness. You will always satisfy. Cause it's honey in the rock, there's water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need, you've got this honey in the rock, purpose in your plan. Power in the blood, healing in your hands Started flowing when you said it is done Everything you did is enough 
There's honey in the rock. 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 I keep looking. Cause I keep looking. And I keep finding. You keep giving. You keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. And I keep praying. You keep moving. I keep praising. You keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. Yes, I keep looking. I keep finding. You keep giving. You keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. And I keep praying. You keep moving. And I keep praising. You keep proving. There's honey in the rock, there's purpose in your plan, power in the blood, healing in your hands. Started flowing when you said it is done. Yes, Jesus, who you are is enough. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. so good to sing with you all this morning, friends. You can take a seat. And we're going to read a little scripture this morning. Perhaps you might be wondering where this phrase, honey in the rock, comes from. And uh, it's a good question, because uh, it's not a phrase we hear very often. But with this theme of God's provision that we, we've been working with so far this morning, we want to share this passage with you. This is from Deuteronomy 32. And it says this, in a desert land, he found him. And him in this context is the nation of Israel. In a, desert, is it, in a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The Lord alone led him. No foreign god was with him. He made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the, with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag. That's our scripture for this morning, friends. And now the choir is going to lead us in a special song that they've prepared.
Good morning. Uh, I'd love to invite our young disciples, uh, children, to come down and join me if you feel comfortable. You can bring a, an adult or parent with you. Uh, I'd love to share a little bit about Jesus with you before we head off to Sunday school, if that's what you choose to do today. Please, gather around. Hello, Fox. How are you, bud? Good to see you guys. What a joy to be together. Hi, Leah. How are you, sweetie? I know it's kind of weird. I know your name. Well, my name is Dave, and I get to help lead our ministry to college students. You know what a college student is? Who? Somebody who's in high school. Past past high school. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll tell you, some of our college students seem like they might still be in high school. Um, They're my favorite, usually, because I can connect with them easily. Hey, um, this morning, I want to share, you know, Jesus says something really interesting. He says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Anyone know what a seed is? Something Something that grows something? Absolutely. Yeah, seed grows something. Yeah, it can grow a flower. It could grow maybe a tree or a shrub uh, or some sort of plant, right? It's the way a plant makes another plant, is it grows a seed and the seed goes into the world. In fact, right now... Uh, maybe some of you are experiencing seasonal allergies where um, our plants are just distributing pollen at, at will and uh, making those of us who suffer from, uh, from, from them as an allergen uh, quite uncomfortable, which is my experience, but uh, need I digress? <laughs> Seeds uh, are made from pollen, but that's also not why we're here this morning. You know what's interesting? Um, my mother's father was a seed farmer. Did you know that? You probably didn't. I hardly remember it. Sometimes he would have uh, crops of carrots. And Grandpa, why, do you, why are you growing carrots right now? To eat them? Nope. Those carrots taste terrible, grandson. I'm growing them for seed. Jesus knows something about seeds too. Hold on a sec, Fox. Let's talk after real quick. It's Jesus knows something about seeds too. And that's that a tiny seed doesn't stay tiny forever, does it? No. Does it get bigger? It does. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. He says, the kingdom of God, the reality of me in the world is like a seed. It starts small, but it grows into something else and something bigger. He says, like the mustard seed, it's a tiny seed, but it grows into a big bush, a big tree that can, birds can live in it. Now, can a bird live in a seed? No. No, it's too small, but a bird can live in a mustard bush. It starts small in the world, but it grows into something bigger, more significant. A tree, exactly. Now, here's an example of how this could work. The kingdom of God, God coming into the world, could be like this. Has anyone been in a class before where somebody was new to the classroom after school had started? You know, Corbin, you know someone who was new to your classroom? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So we, in our class, we learned a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago. Okay, so what was the name of the person? The new person? Um, Asita. As- Asita? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, great example. Okay, when you're new to a class, it can be kind of scary, right? Could you imagine coming into class and you don't know anybody? Maybe that'll be you after this. I don't know. I get kind of scared going into a class when I'm new. But the kingdom of God could be like this. What if you were the person that showed kindness to the person who was new in the classroom? And they went from feeling like a stranger, somebody who didn't belong, to somebody who felt included. Do you think they'd want to come back and be a part of our community next week? If they felt welcome? The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's a little bit of love that can change things and go a long way. Do we think that we could bring the kingdom of God into our world? by doing little things like loving somebody new? All right, let's try that today. Here's a blessing for you children as we head out to Sunday school. May the Lord give you all curious minds to learn, soft hearts to grow, and ready feet to be like Jesus to, no matter where you go, with God's help and grace. Is there a next slide? 
Is that it? Oh, yes. May you know how loved you are by God and by your church family. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is time for Sunday school. Fox, what's up, bud? What were you thinking? Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thanks for your graciousness. I don't know if anybody knows the preaching schedule publicly, which is just fine. I'd prefer that you uh, didn't know I was preaching in advance. So, uh, but whatever. Uh, I, I learned of this uh, opportunity. I get to uh, have permission from Emily to share this. But Emily Kreider was scheduled, and she had something brilliant prepared. Um, but appendicitis got the best of her on Friday. She had successful, uh, the thing where they remove your appendix, <laughs> a, appendectomy. Okay. And so, of course, that was uh, a scary, challenging day for Emily on Friday. We're grateful for uh, a successful surgery. Um, and she's at home on the mend, and I'm the, the pinch hitter today. So, um, so anyway, so, <laughs> so you may be gracious. Um, well, we're starting a series called Tell It Slant, looking at par the parables of Jesus. Now, Jesus, uh, we can categorize as, as many things, but if you were to ask somebody in the first century, tell me about this Jesus person, they probably in the first sentence, like in the, in the bio of Jesus, it's like, J Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus was a teacher, um, and so he would teach. And one of the uh, primary ways that Jesus taught was through this form called uh, a parable, a story. And it's a true story, but it's uh, not necessarily like a historically true story, uh, but, uh, but a story that tells and explains and reveals something of deeper truth and often has uh, truth and meaning just beyond its face value and, and offers a limitless uh, exploration. And he told a lot of these. Now, I think this is true of, of most of the parables. I believe this to be true of most of the parables, that, that the, the point of the parables is to provoke questions. This is not just like Jesus is trying to explain like the, 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 the scientific fact about how something is. Jesus is telling a story in a way to provoke questions, to get us to think about deeper things. Um, to, 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 for our minds and our hearts to go um, into to other and deeper places. It's meant to provoke questions. And, and if you're familiar with any of Jesus' parables, um, they can provoke a lot of great questions. The other thing about parables is that they can simultaneously provide comfort to us and be disturbing. They can provide comfort, like, wow, that's really encouraging, and at the same time, I'm deeply disturbed by something that just happened in this parable. And, and that's the power of parable. Today, our parable comes from Luke, chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. And, and, and Luke has, in Luke's gospel, Jesus has um, uh, offered some really um, thick teaching. Uh, uh, the, uh, much of it is the, the, the content we see in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. And in Luke, uh, it's, it's, I would say, even a little bit more aggressive. He's... Uh, uh, done miracles in communities, and uh, and we see in this that that he's starting to grow a following. Okay, so Jesus is not uh, obscure an obscure rabbi. Jesus is a rabbi who's on the map. People want to come see him, and that's how uh, our our parable even starts out. The, the 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 setup for the parable. It says, while a large crowd was gathered. Uh, so, excuse me, while a, a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. He was scattering the seed. Uh, excuse me, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seeds fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than it was sown. 
when he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. And here he's referencing a passage in Isaiah. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they... when, uh, excuse me, that receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, produce a crop. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, Would you pray with me? So Jesus, would you give, illumine um, by your spirit uh, what it is that you have for us this morning in this parable? Lord, thank you that your wisdom is both mysterious and clear, that it's compelling and and, and means for us to move further into your heart. May that be true for us this morning. Amen. Well, to me, when I read this passage, there's a lot of questions, but there are three questions that rise specifically to the surface for me. First, Why did Jesus tell this parable to a crowd that he didn't intend for them to understand? Okay, imagine this. You're a public speaker. People are literally leaving their towns, and they're not hopping in their car or an Uber. They are walking to hear you teach. You have the masses. You are Billy Graham at the podium in Memorial Stadium in Los Angeles. The people are here to to hear you. They're there to hear you. And you tell a story that you do not intend for them to understand. Puzzle Puzzle me that. That doesn't seem like good strategy to me. So that's one question I have. The second, why is the sower so reckless with broadcasting the seed? What kind of cotton headed ninny muggins is this sower? Are they not aware of how seed works? And then when we learn that the seed is a metaphor for the Word of God, why is the Word of God so vulnerable? Doesn't that make you uncomfortable? Why does the Word of God seem so vulnerable and ineffective most of the time? Oof. So... If you're reading the Word of God and you've come across moments like this that make you feel uncomfortable, like, like that, I, I think that's part of the point, okay? So be assured that, well, hopefully we're not moving into heresy. I had this um, really wonderful professor um, at, at Fuller, and he mostly taught night classes, and I was working, so he was my guy. Um, and uh, he would start every class by saying, um, 10% of what I'm going to teach you this, this quarter is heresy. I'm just not sure which 10% it is. And I think he was serious about that because he just assumed that he was wrong about at least 10% of what he was going to teach. Anyway, okay, so those three questions. Why did Jesus tell the parable to a crowd that he didn't intend for them to understand? Why is the sower so stinking reckless? And why is the word of God so vulnerable? We'll save the last questions for first, but I believe that when we wrestle with these questions, we'll arrive to the wisdom, to wisdom that will be valuable for us today. First, why is the sower so reckless with his broadcasting of seed? Doesn't the sower know that a path is not a good place for plants to grow? There are a few species that do well in cracks in the pavement, 
But I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the sort of seed that the sower is spreading, right? Rocks, also, not a great place to grow seed. You know, consider the landscape in so many of our yards. I, we live in a relatively new, land, uh, new neighborhood, and it's like half of our yards are rocks so that plants don't grow, right? So we don't have to water them. And I'm slowly ripping my rocks out and planting plants. I'm sorry to, to the water, but I love plants. Anyway, and thorn briars, also a terrible place to grow, right? I mean, thorns are wildly competitive. Being from the Northwest, the Himalayan blackberry has taken over any sort of open space with a bit of light. And uh, they're wonderful to eat mid to late summer. But I tell you what, you would never plant anything that you would expect to grow underneath a Himalayan blackberry. It has no future. And yet here we see the sower casting out the seed. A couple of weeks ago, um, we had uh, the opportunity as the Annex community to spend our spring break uh, in Southern California and Oceanside. And we had, there were 31 of us in this sort of compound um, adjacent to the ocean. And we had, it was a really wonderful and meaningful time. Um, lots of worship, a lot of, in the evenings, our students led worship, and then the full day was uh, just filled with adventures around town. And one evening, it was so, so adventurous that Alan proposed uh, to Abby, which was, of course, the highlight of the week. Um, anyway, so lots of great things. But uh, one of the last days we're there, and it, it was a bit rainy. And so we decided we'd go to Balboa Park, which is in the city of San Diego, a really wonderful sort of cultural center um, for San Diego. And uh, there's a museum there, the Tim Ken Museum, and it's a wonderful, if you don't love art museums, this is the perfect art museum. One, because it's free, and two, I know, Cody, you're feeling this, okay? <laughs> you'll impress Kelsey, you'll impress Kelsey. Check the box, you're cultured. But there's only like 25 paintings, it's like bite-sized, right? And there's uh, masters represented here. You know, we've got one Jacques-Louis David, one Rembrandt, um, and, and one Peter Bruegel painting. And this painting uh, is featured uh, in this museum. And so I got to enjoy this painting uh, uh, from, from this museum. And it's, it's the parable of the sower. And I've never thought of this parable in these terms. It, this, this is a landscape painting, right? This is more like Bierstadt. Right? If you're familiar with Bierstadt, who, the, the fabulous landscape painter, like, this is like epic. And here we have in the corner, and it, this, it's cropped a little bit. There's a little bit, there's more rocks in the foreground, but um, here we have like the sower just out and about in this landscape, just chucking seeds everywhere. And I think, I think Bruegel was onto something when he painted the parable this, this way. It's like the whole landscape is getting saturated with the seed. It's not like, it's not, I think we're meant to see in this parable, it's not like the sower just happened to be a bad aim. That there were paths along the field and thorns along. It's like, no, the sower is in this vast world chucking the seed so it can be saturated in the entire landscape. One of the jobs that I was able to do with my father at his greenhouse um, uh, as a child was, uh, <clears throat> was uh, helping him uh, plant uh, seed beds. And, and, and the way this worked, and what I would do is I'd take the, take the flats of seeds, and they were all little dots of soil for specifically calibrated for growing seeds. You'd put them in this, like, a plastic kind of greenhouse container, so it like made a little greenhouse, and we put them next to growing lights adjacent to the boiler and the and the kitchen in the greenhouse room. It kind of anyway, whatever. Uh, too many details, but the point of I'm trying to, to make here about the way these seeds worked. My dad had this machine, and he'd pull out these seeds from from Ball Seed Company, and and he'd pour them gently into the top of the seed loader, and. And, and the seeds would, would, would line up, and the, each seed would grab onto the end of this little, like, module thing that would tip over and perfectly land. So there'd be one seed, one seed per square, and the squares were, like, half an inch big. And there were, like, hundreds of them in this, in this seed thing. 
and, and the machine makes sure there was one seed per square because you didn't want more than one. You wanted one seed, and you wanted it in the right place. And, and we were batting a 1,000, right, when it came to growing the seeds. And then, and then when they got bigger and they sprouted, somebody would transplant them and put in a larger pot, and we'd sell them to you, you know, for two seventy nine dollars or whatever, okay? <laughs> but we were surgical when it came to sowing seeds. There was little waste. And here we have this sower broadcasting the seed everywhere. The second question I have, I think, is kind of the same question, but maybe the, the other side of the cone. Why is the word of God, because we find out Jesus explains that the seed is the word of God in this parable, like a seed, it's so vulnerable and seemingly ineffective, right? Right? I mean, there's so many seeds in the world. Like, have you ever, like, seen, like, an oak tree, like, standing alone on a grassy hill? That's, like, kind of a, a California landscape, right? And, and it's like, wow, what a majestic tree. And you look under the tree, and there are thousands, thousands of acorns, and not another stinking oak tree. That's because the, the, the Quercus genus has, like, poison in its leaves, so it poisons its own babies so that it doesn't compete. But that's a whole other issue. Okay. <laughs> But the seed is so vulnerable. But God seems to be content to extend his gospel himself into the world despite significant waste. Jesus offers um, an explanation after he tells first the parable, right? Just the kind of bare bones parable. He tells his parable, and then the disciples are, what's going on here? So Jesus offers an explanation just to, the, to the, his disciples. And in, in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 8, we find it's Jesus, the 12, and then a group of other people, a bunch of women, actually, that are a part of his uh, group of disciples. And it's actually the women who are paying uh, the way, so to speak, for Jesus and, and the other guys, um, which is an interesting detail, but that wasn't included in my assigned scripture. I thought I'd just toss it in there. Um, but he explains it to this smaller group, and he explains, so the seed is the word of God. And where it lands, as we find out, where it lands in the parable is the condition of the heart's that receive it. So God's word lands with mixed results because of the condition of the human heart. It's as if to say, this, I will throw the seed so that it has a chance in every human heart, but the response to it will be uh, dependent on, on what the soil is like of that human heart. And he describes these four different types of soil. The, the snatching bird, which to me is the most disturbing one. I don't know about you, but this one feels really disturbing. It's, it's the bird, the devil, who takes, takes the word of God out of their heart so that they won't believe and be saved, is what Jesus said. That to me feels like, well, this feels very vulnerable, Jesus. But, but think about how the Bible starts. The first time we, you know, the devil, Satan, enters the picture, right? The snake... What the snake does is, 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 is not necessarily, I don't know, extract everything that was true that the Adam and Eve had received about God, but just implant a different story, right? Get us to believe a different story that, that, uh, about ourselves in the world. And I think this is what, what and, and when, when we believe a different story, we've talked about this, right? How, what the story we believe will shape our hearts, and it'll shape the way we live in the world. Do we believe the true story about Jesus and his gospel, or do we believe the other stories that, that are made up about the world that presume to be true, but ultimately do not lead to life and wholeness the way the truth does? And the devil is in the business of telling us stories that are not true about ourselves and the world and God. And man, there are so many stories that can be like a bird snatching up the truth from our heart. The rocky ground received in their heart, but the roots are shallow. It's hard to grow deep roots, in, in just on, in, especially in rocks, I suppose. <clears throat> and when times get tough, 
when the heat of life come, when the storms of life come, remember the other parable? Perhaps you've heard this parable of the the person who builds their house on the rock and builds their house on the sand. And the assumption at the end of that parable is that when the storms come, when life gets really hard, when the heat comes, when life gets really hard, the seeds in the rocky soil fade away. And friends, I have to tell you, as a college pastor, this feels like a really common experience watching my students, former students, go into the world and the word of God in their heart. And then the thorns. Oh, this, I mean, this is a whole sermon, perhaps sermon series. To me, this might be one of the most uh, 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 indicting moments in the parables of Jesus. The thorns. The heart is consumed. The the plant takes root. There's leaves. You can tell that it's a plant that's grown from the kingdom. But it's consumed with life's worries. Oof, how many of us just live in anxiety? Think anxiety is just normal. When we think about anxiety, it's all about mitigating anxiety, not about coming out of anxiety to living in peace and wholeness and shalom. So, a heart consumed with worries, a heart consumed with riches, making the money, making sure we're okay, providing for ourselves, and pleasure. Oof. And the picture that Jesus gives is not a withered plant. It's not a plant that's snatched up by, by the birds by a false narrative. It's a plant that can tell you the true story, but it's a plant that stays stunted and never bears the fruit of the kingdom because ultimately life became not about the kingdom, not about Jesus, but about the worries, about making money, and about being happy. And so this seed ultimately is rendered to be fruitless, in the story that Jesus tells. And then there's the good soil. It says a noble or good heart. Some translations say honest, uh, uh, sound, beautiful, wise. A good heart that hears. Jesus said, those who have ears to listen, let them hear. So first they hear it, and then they retain it, right? It's not quickly uh, uh, lost on them. And then they persevere. They persevere. So that um, uh, 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 it, this is, the, the seed in life is, is not a, a, a momentary sort of spiritual high, but it's something that takes deep root um, and, and persists. Um, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your heart will develop perseverance. And perseverance must, must finish its work so that you may be pure and blameless, not lacking anything. That any fruitful plant that we have benefited from is fruitful because it's maintained and it's persevered. The plants that grow the best grapes for the most delicious wines are plants that are intentionally planted in places where they will struggle for greatness and develop into something mature and beautiful. So there's a struggle there. So you, you might think, oh man, the good soil means it's the gravy train spiritual life and a hundredfold because I'm good soil. But here we see embedded in Jesus' teaching that, that fruitfulness comes from perseverance in the word. Regardless, though, We see Jesus broadcasting the seed to all human hearts, regardless of their condition. Because regardless of the seed's potential for growth in a person's heart, the sower is determined to spread it there anyway. What kind of sower is this? It's like the sower, it's like the word, the seed, 
It's like the word that goes out like a father loves a child. Who, who created the child, who, who identifies the child as its own beloved, that does everything that the father can in, in his power to bring the child up so that the child can flourish and have life, right? But at the end of the day, the child gets to go where the child wants to go. And the father's left on the front porch wondering when the child comes home from the land overseas or sees his other son in the field toiling away, waiting for him to understand that he's not interested in being impressed with his moral life, but just waiting for him to understand that he is beloved because he is his son, his daughter. It's kind of like that love. It's a vulnerable love, is it not? To be a parent is to be in love in a vulnerable way. This is the word of the God, the word of God in the world. So why would Jesus tell this parable the way he does to a crowd that won't understand it? We actually find out um, in a moment so um, that the, um, the parable in that moment, I think we can explain it this way, the parable in that moment is to teach G, uh, the, for Jesus to teach the disciples something important um, about the way that the kingdom works in the world. But it won't stay hidden for long. And in fact, immediately after this parable and the explanation of it, Jesus says, nothing hidden that will not, nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be um, known or brought out into the open. Nobody um, puts a lamp, uh, uh, lights a lamp and then, puts, and then covers it is what Jesus says immediately after this. So you might be a little confused. Why are you being cryptic, Jesus? But Jesus is ultimately saying, my truth will go out into the world. You, you cannot conceal the truth is what he says. But why would Jesus tell this parable the way that he does? As disciples of Jesus, I think he wants us to see this, that we will be beneficiaries of the reckless sower who is content to share his gospel with a world that will largely reject it. Imagine the disciples. Here's Jesus who's doing miracles, and he's going from town to town proclaiming the kingdom of God. And they may have in their mind this image of God, Yahweh God. In Isaiah, the, I, I believe the most often reference to God is Yahweh of angel armies. This big vision of God with power and all the might behind him. And so when Jesus is out saying, talking about the kingdom, perhaps they're expecting that this kingdom is going to come in force. And in time, boom, like we will be on the winning side. And we will all know how good it feels to win, right? To be the empire, the kingdom on top. But here, Jesus is painting a very different picture of the kingdom coming into the world as a vulnerable and what seems to be an ineffective seed being broadcast in love so that those could hear it and respond to it. The, the disciples themselves will be beneficiaries of this reckless sower. But consider the contrast between this vision of the kingdom of God and perhaps the Roman Empire and the way that these first century um, um, Hebrews uh, living in, in this uh, area of north of Jerusalem would have experienced it, that this is an, uh, the Roman Empire, an effective kingdom, right? Known for conquering with great efficiency, with brute force, and no one could deny their power. And Jesus is painting this picture of a kingdom that looks so different in how it's coming into the world. I think Jesus is trying to say to the disciples, guys, don't be discouraged. Don't have the wrong expectations for how my kingdom's coming into this world. Success is going to look different than you thought it would be. See, the kingdom of God is effective when it gets under our skin and into our hearts, right? It doesn't bowl us over. Nobody's forced or coerced into love and heart transformation, right? It's kindness that leads us to repentance, not being barraged by the truth, perhaps with brute power. 
The kingdom of God is effective when it gets under our skin, into our heart. And then when it takes root in somebody's life, in a disciple's life where the soil is ready, it, it, it multiplies a hundredfold. I got to spend about six years of my life in and around the Santa Monica Mountains, which if you're not familiar with Southern California, there are, there are actually mountains there. And a couple weeks ago, um, being there for spring break, I got to witness more snow on those mountains than I think I've, I have ever seen. It's very green right now. It's very beautiful. But anyway, it's not normally like uh, green uh, and quite that sort of beauty. But uh, being in the Santa Monica Mountains, or, uh, I worked at a, a church in Malibu. And in the springtime, about this time, the hills would go from being just like really brown, very rough on the eyes, to green and yellow. This mustard seed. It's actually an invasive species in that part of the world. But anyway, and it just absolutely takes over the entire landscape. And I think this is what Jesus is trying to say. Like, this tiny seed, when it takes root in somebody's life and then is broadcast again and again and multiplied, it will change the world. But it's got to get under your skin and into your heart. And you've got to understand the one who's sowing it to understand the substance of it as well. See, because of this, okay, as, and I'm landing the plane. As fruitful disciples of Jesus, see, we will also be sowers of the gospel in the same reckless way. I believe we are meant to see Jesus as the sower, but are we also not supposed to proclaim the kingdom of God as well in the world as disciples of Jesus? And so it's as if Jesus is bringing these 12 together and say, I want you to understand how this will be effective in the world. It's going to seem, it's going to seem um, unintelligent, uh, poor strategy, ineffective and vulnerable. But yet when it takes root in one person's heart, it's going to blow up. And you too, my friend, will be that sower. Back to the Bruegel painting up here. This is something I didn't notice when I was there in San Diego. But if you see on the shore here, there's a group of people around a boat. Bruegel is painting Jesus in this picture, but not as the sower. Jesus is in the distance teaching people on the shoreline out of a boat. And it's as if he's inviting us to, to see ourselves as the sower who's out in the world casting the seed recklessly with great abandon in our own lives. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, the reckless sower as his beloved. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the wisdom that feels like foolishness. Thank you for the wisdom that makes sense only when it takes root in our hearts, when we give way to surrender and trust. Jesus, thank you for the wisdom that only makes sense too when we see and discover ourselves as beloved. And so, Lord, may those things be true by your Spirit in our lives today, that we could surrender to your wisdom, surrender to our belovedness, and receive with gratitude the word that you give to us through your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to be people who are patient, who are persistent, who hear, who retain and persevere the word in our lives. Lord, may this community be a witness in the city of Boulder to your kingdom. May we not be discouraged when we don't see quick and immediate and big results, which our culture tells us if, if we don't see those, then we're not succeeding. Lord, help us to be faithful, to, um, to, to be fruitful. Perhaps the growth is slow, Lord. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I'll invite you to stay seated for this next song that we're going to play. Um, I've, I've talked about this song before. This is a song called the, that's built off of this parable. Uh, it's called The Road, the Rocks, and the Weeds by, uh, by John Mark McMillan. 
And I'd say the thing that I love about this song is how uncertain it is. Uh, when, when he says, I've got no answers for, for heartbreaks or cancers, but a, but a Savior who suffers them with me. And like Dave said, um, what I love about this song is that this, these parables seem to be, the, the point of them seems to be provoke questions rather than give uh, certain specific answers. And uh, the, the only other thing I'd say about this song is, is what, what John Mark's doing in this song is he's, he's contrasting this word of God that is embodied in Jesus with uh, this, this notion of, of, you know, if you know anything about Greek mythology, about these gods who are far off that, that humans are try constantly trying to get to and striving to get to, contrasted with this word of God that is freely sown and given abundantly. So that's what I'd offer to us as we, as we begin to, to play this one. You're welcome to sing along with us, or, or if you'd like to just sit and meditate on the lyrics, uh, you're free to do that as well. Come down from the stars, show you human scars, and tell me what it's like to believe from my Christ on it thoughts that the loss is you. Nights that you peopled with your dreams Well, I've got no answers for heartbreaks or cancers But a Savior who suffers them with me Singing goodbye, old Memphis, the heart of my maker Is spread out on Come down from your mountain, your high rise apart, and tell me of the God you know who bleeds, and what to tell my daughter when she asks so many questions, and I fail to fill her heaviness with peace, because I've got no answers for her needs or cancer. But a Savior who suffers them with me Singing goodbye, Olympus The heart of my maker Is spread out on the road The rocks and the And Aphrodite would not weep Nor Zeus would suffer for the weak but have you come to stand inside my pain? And all the things I begged you for, eternity nevermore, are hidden with me here beneath the rain. The
Will you pray with me for a few more minutes? Dear Lord, we come to you today with so many thoughts. Calm us. We praise you today for that for generations you have pursued us. First as a covenant people, then with our Messiah, Jesus. And now with your Holy Spirit and the written word. We praise you for your faithfulness, even as we have turned away from you so many times. Father, we ask that as we spend time in the stories and parables given by Jesus, you'll show us how our hearts can be aligned with you and how our hearts need to change to grow closer to you. Lord, I confess that I tend to turn toward myself for strength and peace instead of you. Take a moment now to reflect on those things that you turn to instead of our Lord. Lord, as a church body, we ask for your guidance as we move forward into the future that you have in store for us. We pray for patience and faithfulness for our staff, volunteers, and church officers. Pray for our new lead pastor and for our pastoral nominating committee. For them, we ask for wisdom and for leading by your Holy Spirit. As we seek to be salt and light in our community, we ask to be welcoming and generous. We ask for you to teach us how to love those around us more like Jesus every day. Heavenly Father, we lift up and remember those we know and those far away who are hurting or scared or in danger. And especially this morning, we pray for Emily Kreider for healing from her emergency appendectomy. Comfort those with your presence. Give them strength for each day and the joy of knowing that your love endures forever. Now let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For it is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn.
friendly reminder that uh, 11 a.m., which is in 25 minutes in Westminster Hall, which is, if you go through two, two walls this way, you'll run into it, um, uh, is our newcomers' uh, coffee time. We'd love to connect with you. Um, our, my friends to, to my right here, uh, our prayer ministers, would love to pray with you, for you. Uh, if there's people that you'd like to lift up or you would like prayer yourself, um, they are gifted and um, passionate about that. And then opportunity to give um, uh, box, boxes in the back on your way out. Friends, King Jesus comes into the world and reveals himself to be a reckless sower of his word, his gospel, his love in the world. Casting it to every human heart. May it take root in our hearts that we would surrender and trust his, belo- his love, that we would know we are his beloved. And may we be reckless and extravagant in the way we share his gospel in the world, in our actions and in our words. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.